Good evening, everyone. We're welcoming you to Townsville, to our Bible study tonight, and I hope and pray that it will be a great blessing and a source of inspiration to you at this time. Shall we pray? Father, we just ask you to take that little that we have, and Lord, do what you did when that little boy brought those loaves and fishes. You expanded, you developed, and you increased his gift. We give the little we have to you tonight. We thank you for those that are poised and ready and hungry to know the word of God. And we ask you that the Holy Spirit will be so real to each and every one of us. We're reliant upon your power. We're reliant upon your grace. We're reliant upon the Holy Spirit to lead our thinking and to open our hearts to respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the uh, theme is the naked Jew. And what does that mean? What does that signify? Well, we turn to the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, and there we have the answer. My sheep, says God, wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. All the flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field. Because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. So we have it in verse 6 and verse 5 before it, that they were scattered, they became food for all the beasts of the field, and as a result, wandered. And that's where we get the often repeated phrase, the wandering Jew. From nation to nation, from region to region, the Jew wandered for 2,000 years. From AD 70 to the present day, they are scattered throughout all the nations of the earth. But there's a difference. Over the last few decades, God has been doing a wonderful thing. In fact, last week we saw, and we won't refer to it except in passing, that in Ezekiel 37, God blew and breathed and prophesied that the nation that was scattered, dismembered, and no more it would have appeared, would suddenly come together and become a great and mighty army in the nations of the world. And that has happened since 1948, when the modern state of Israel was declared by David Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv, Israel has not only been born, but it has grown, it has flourished. And one can only say, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now we have a number of scriptures that we're going to refer to. Did you notice that sad scripture there that says, uh, and I hate even reading of it, no one was seeking or searching for them. In the last terrible pogrom called the Holocaust, the terrible Shoah, the burning that came upon Israel scattered at that time in occupied Europe, very few people stood up and were brave enough to defend and to take into their homes, to hide, to protect those hapless Jews in uh, the various countries where Hitler's armies were just mowing them down, taking them to death camps. 
Did you know today is the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Mulhausen, the uh, terrible concentration camp, and indeed a death camp uh, that was liberated this day 76 years ago today by the American troops that were moving on towards Berlin and the conquest of not only Nazi Germany, but countries all around that were under its power and domination. And we remember very, very quietly and sadly the uh, terrible things that had occurred there, the great uh, quarry, the steep steps, the cruelty, and that, of course, was repeated time and time and time again, all because, by and large, there were few that would stand up and say, enough is enough. In fact, when we turn to the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, we read these words of Israel. This is a people robbed and plundered, and we know that for sure, uh, that indeed they were robbed and plundered of all their worldly goods in occupied Europe. And of them are snared in holes. They are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers for plunder, and no one says, restore. And yet God, in his sovereign mercy, says, I will restore. I will indeed come to my people, and I will bring them home. In fact, there's a marvellous scripture in the fifth chapter of Isaiah. Are you familiar with it? I just, I'm just amazed about it. It says here, speaking of the end times, um, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them, stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all this... His anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar. He will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt on their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals be broken. In that day they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and if one looks to the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by the clouds. In the midst of the terror, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of all that was the Holocaust, God began to work. And I want you to come with me into one of the most beautiful psalms speaking about God's restoration. Psalm 102. This is a tremendous psalm regarding the restoration of Israel. It is also a second coming psalm, and we'll get to that in a moment. When we look at God's dealing with his people Israel, the Apostle Paul says very clearly in Corinthians that these are types and these are wonderful indicators that what God has done for his people Israel, he will also do for his church. And of course, Jesus said to his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we know that all around the world, even today, we know of the great persecution that is going on in the world. And of course, even in uh, lackadaisical, 
uh, Australia, there is mounting opposition to the evangelical, the Bible-believing, and the spirit-filled church. Very few people care much about the dead church and the formalistic church. That's just disregarded as being of no consequence. <clears throat> but once the church stands up and with a prophetic mantle says, thus says the Lord, then you will see coming to the fore great persecution. It may come at first with ridicule and also with lots of laughter and scorn. And of course, a lot of people are intimidated by that. But other people will, standing true to the word, will indeed suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. We had a marvellous speaker at our church on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. And he spoke wonderfully about how he was humbled in his heart, challenged to his very core when he saw that the church is growing massively in three places in the world today. The first is Afghanistan. The second is Iran. And the third, would you believe this, is North Korea. Every one of those nations is under terrific persecution if you're a Christian. If you're a person that has suddenly read the Bible, heard the Bible, by whatever means that you've heard it, you have embraced the truth and given Jesus Christ your heart, your life, your everything, you will be a marked man or woman or young person. And in spite of martyrdom, in spite of imprisonment, in spite of privation and persecution, the churches in these places are going from strength to strength. In the 1980s, 1986, I had the privilege and an honour that God gave me, and a friend of mine as well, to go into the then communist countries, places like Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, and then we went into Russia and, of course, into Ukraine. And there were degrees of persecution in those countries. There didn't seem to be great persecution in Russia in the Moscow region, but it depended where you went, what region. But in Ukraine, there was monitoring. We were followed time and time again. On numerous occasions, we were talked to by people we knew were secret agents or KGB uh, emissaries. We knew that. And yet the glow in the hearts and the countenance of the people of God was breathtaking. I remember sitting on the flight that was to take us from Moscow to Tokyo on our journey home and sinking into my seat and thinking about all the weeks that had gone before, people we'd met, pastors we'd fellowship with. And I thought to myself, this is absolutely amazing. Wherever there was persecution, there was a greater degree of commitment and a great joy was in the hearts of the people. A year or two later, we went up into an area of the Ukraine, bordering Romania and Poland in the Carpathian Mountains. And as we were driving up those very, very high mountains, I said to the pastor, you know, when we apply for a visa to come here, we have to put down where we're going. I had no idea that we would be coming the Carpathian Mountains, or I would have put that in the application. And I presume it would have been okayed. Oh, he said, it doesn't matter. Well, I said, it does matter because if we're stopped, our visa is examined, uh, they're going to, well, 
Well, what are they going to do? Are they going to just simply deport us and note that we're not to return again? Or would they even imprison us? Oh, he said, how wonderful if they did. Well, that gave me a shock. He said, oh, how wonderful if you, if you were in prison. He said, think of the good you could do in the prisons. A totally different outlook to my nice, cuddly, cosy Christianity. And that's what our speaker said last Sunday as he heard of the quality of commitment, as he heard of the persecution in Afghanistan and persecution in North Korea and the mass executions in places uh, like uh, Iran and even in China, he thought to himself, oh God, you know, I am just a believer. They are true disciples. There's a big difference between just being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, totally saved, totally redeemed, with a hope of heaven and its glories, but really, will we wear a crown? There's such a laxity, such a compromise, and I see it daily, even here in Australia, with such a compromising group of people, and we may have to face ourselves the persecution that these dear folk have done so that we are refined and thus ready for the coming of the Lord. The Bible says that the things that happen to the forefathers of Israel and the nation indeed are signs, are principles of what the Christian believer can look forward to. And you know, there are three things. We are trusting in his mercy every day. We're trusting in his mercy. And we dare not trifle with that mercy. You know, we so easily play games with God, bargain with him, ask God to look after us, ask God to bless us, ask God to just provide for us without any thought whatsoever of laying down our lives because we love him and because that's an honour and that is a great and mighty Indeed, it is a great honour to do so. So uh, we are trusting in his mercy. And of course, we're trusting in his grace. And we're not to trifle with that mercy. We're not to presume upon it. But rather, we are to triumph in his mercy. And that's indeed what believing Israel does. It trusts, doesn't trifle doesn't look to the left or the right, but rather looks straight on to serve the Lord, to serve the God of Israel without flinching and without flaw. And God will reveal himself to his prepared people. Ezekiel chapter 36 says, prior to the coming of Jesus, he will sprinkle Israel with pure water. He will call them, according to Isaiah chapter 5, he will whistle for them. Now, wait a moment. What's the difference between being called by God to come home to Israel and to be whistled? Aren't they one and the same? Well, you'd think so. And the end result, one has to say, yes. The end result is they come home. But I want to tell you that there are two types of people that come back and make aliyah to Israel. There are the conscientious, observant Jews who know the law and the prophets and they know what God has promised, what Ezekiel has promised, Isaiah, even Habakkuk, Zechariah, Zephaniah, the psalmists, they know that. Isaiah is enriched within their hearts and on the basis of the call of God through the prophets, 
they make Aliyah. But then there's another group of those going home to Israel. And they are people that are not in the slightest bit observant in their faith. In fact, they don't have a faith. They are, in fact, secular Jews. And they come for many and varied reasons, sometimes because of opportunism. Ah, oh, we'll be able to get a good job there and we'll be able to use our skills there and we'll be lapped up by the government and, and you know, we've got a greater future there. In other words, they feel they'll be a big fish in a small pond. Some have come, and quite understandably, they have come because they are persecuted or they fear persecution or they're sensible enough and have foresight and can see the rumblings on the horizon and the anti-Semitism that is rising. And they say, aha, uh, things are going to hot up. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be safe to be a Jew. They don't realise that God is whistling to them. When you whistle, unless there's a reminiscent uh, a tune with words, there is no words. It's just a, an instinctive call that you hear. And I have very dear friends in Israel who are not observant. They are purely secular. In fact, uh, one dear friend of mine uh, was brought up by a very atheistic mother and father. And their atheism, so-called, and I say that guardedly because I don't know how deep that so-called profession of atheism was, but the, their claim to not believe in God and to resist God was purely on the basis that so many of their families had perished in the Holocaust. They were European who had themselves come through, been saved and preserved and even protected by the minority of people in Holland that looked after them. And uh, when they came back to their home, they found that all of their family had been taken and murdered in the death camps. And that brought about a hatred in their hearts. And they got out of Europe and they went to South Africa and there they set up a home and got employment and had a family. And then in South Africa, they said a most astounding thing to me. They said, suddenly, we just had sort of a, a whim. We were comfortable in South Africa. We were well provided for. We were not persecuted. There were no rumblings on the horizon that gave us any degree of fear that things would change. But somehow, some way, we just had to go to Israel. And so this family of four gathered up their belongings, sold off any property they had, and came back to Israel. When I say came back to Israel, they'd never been in Israel. But they came as Israel back into the land. <clears throat> you see, the whistle of God had caught their attention. They weren't interested at all in the promises or the prophecies of the prophets, but they had this instinctive urge to come to Israel and to come home. Do you know there is no migration of Jews to Israel? That's a secular, that is a non-Jewish phrase. You see, a Jew doesn't migrate to Israel. An Israeli comes back to his land. It's his land historically, fundamentally, foundationally. So he makes Aliyah. He comes up to Israel and Jerusalem. That is his homeland. He's actually coming home. I think about 1960, 
1963, I think 1962, as a young person in our youth group, we were told that on one particular Saturday night, there would be a guest speaker. And this man was going to speak about Israel. I was just uh, 16, I think. And I thought to myself, oh, well, that'll be interesting. And this man brought slides and movies and, and had literature. And, and he was a, a quiet speaker, but a profound one. And he began at the outset of his presentation. His name was Joseph Hunting. He began to speak to us about Israel in prophecy. And he began by reading the psalm that we are going to look at tonight, Psalm 102. This, according to the preface of the psalm, is a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. That's the title, a prayer of an overwhelmed soul. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. When you get to the third and go down to the seventh verse, it becomes very graphic. For my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned like on a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness, like an owl of the desert. I lie awake. I am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Hmm. A pelican in the wilderness. <coughs> You don't see a pelican in the wilderness normally. Why? Because you see a pelican by the rivers, the waterways and the sea. Why? Because they feed on fish. But the pelican of Psalm 102 is a long way from the feeding grounds of the sea and the waterways and the rivers. He is there starving. And also, would you notice about the consumed bodies by fire and smoke? And my bones are burned like a hearth. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. This reminds me so much, so graphically, of the painful pictures that we see. Partly this morning I watched um, a woman whose name was Eva and she talked because this is the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Malthausen. I was watching a, a program where she, would you believe, was born about three days before before the Americans came through the gates of Mauthausen and liberated that concentration camp. She was a little babe in arms. She said she only survived for two reasons. One was the fact that the Americans arrived, but also because her mother held her tightly and shielded her for the couple of days after she was born before the Americans arrived. She said ordinarily, and she was a witness to it, being a Jewish 
girl, her mother was a witness to it, she said that when anyone gave birth, they were regarded with hostility by their captors and they immediately, mother and baby, were taken to the gas chambers. She said, I was spared because two days, or one day actually, before she was born, when her mother began in labour, they ran out of gas. They had no gas cylinders. Had they had the gas, she would have tasted the fate of millions. 1.5 Child, million children were murdered in uh, the gas chambers and by other means by the Nazis. 1.5 million. And of course, over 6 million overall were persecuted, starved, beaten and gassed, deliberately, defiantly in the face of God. And we have these graphic statements by the unnamed psalmist. Now you know that many times you'll have the psalmist revealed, Asaph, Moses, David, Solomon. But here, my bones are burned like a hearth. And then it goes on to say, my bones cling to my skin. But that's not all. There is a understandable, an understandable grief in the heart of the writer. He says, my enemies reproach me all day long, and those who deride me swear an oath against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread. There was a, a woman called Odette Samson, and uh, she had married and uh, her husband had gone to war, and she was bilingual. She spoke perfect French and, of course, uh, English. Somehow, some way, it came to the notice of the uh, special um, branch um, in, in London, that this woman living in a rural area of uh, England was very, very patriotic and was fluent in French and, of course, spoke her native tongue, English. She'd lived for many years as a child in France. So she not only knew the language, but she had all the necessary uh, um, nuances and, and phrases off pat. She could speak fluently in French as she could in English. So they suggested that she be trained and be dropped behind enemy lines in occupied France. And she did. And of course, when I was growing up, her name was synonymous with tremendous bravery. Her name was Odette. And sadly, she was caught and she was tortured and then she was transported to Ravensbrook, which was a horrible place, another death camp. And of course, it was also a place where many were being systematically gassed. And she was in a, a, a sort of a holding cell. She had every confidence, if that's the word, that within a short period of time they'd come and get her and she would be shot as a spy. But things were out of hand, chaos reigned, and uh, the major commitment of the Nazis was to get as many Jews into those gas chambers and to annihilate them as possible. And as she was in her cell of isolation, day after day, she said now and again she would hear the cries and the shuffling of feet. And she looked out of her uh, lowered cell, which wasn't in a dungeon and it wasn't right underground, but it was uh, partially underground. And through the broken window and the bars of her cell, she looked out and she could just see the shuffling of the feet 
and the legs of those victims going to their deaths. And she said, night and day, night and day. She would look out and she would see, especially at night, the glow of the crematorium across the sky. And she said she would taste the ashes in her mouth. She would feel death, sense death, taste death as those people were being bundled cruelly, sadistically into the gas chambers. And then their lifeless body hauled out unceremoniously and then burned. And the ash was flying through from the chimneys into the atmosphere. She said, I can taste it on my lips and tongue. And that's what the psalmist says here. He says these very, very words. I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Now he's speaking as a Jewish person. Because of your indignation and your wrath, you have lifted me up and thrown me to the ground. Now that's how many Jewish folk have felt. ICJ is the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. It has a remarkable ministry for and toward the Holocaust survivors. And uh, in Haifa, they have something like six or seven beautiful rooming houses. They're, they're apartment blocks. And each and every one of them is given to uh, the nursing, they're like nursing homes. They're places of refuge for people now in their late 80s, 90s, even over 100. And there they are nursed and there they are loved in the name of Yeshua. And they are being ministered to. And if you ever get a chance to go to Haifa and you come up from the seaport towards the uh, Baha'i Temple, you will find in that region these places. Do ring ahead and make an appointment, and please, please financially support this wonderful ministry. But when they are ministering to them, as you will find throughout Israel and in Jewish communities around the world, you will find those that feel just as the psalmist, you have lifted me up and cast me away and my days are like a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like grass. There was a remarkable historic uh, documentary series oh well over 40 years ago called The World at War be a bit archaic now I suppose it was narrated by Sir Laurence Olivier and when it came to highlighting the desperate plight of the Jew he mentions that an eyewitness saw a rabbi going to his death with his hands raised in the spirit of this psalm and the spirit of the psalmist. Why? 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 Cast us off and cast us to the ground. Why? Why? And I know that it's easy in, in comfort and security and especially as a Gentile to be able to sit back and, and almost uh, say, in a, a very, very cool and collected way. Well, of course, you know, God turned up and, you know, turned it around. But if it was your parent, if it was your brother, if it was your child thrown into the gas chamber, wouldn't you ask why? Of course you would. And so there is needed wisdom and compassion, tenderness and grace and the Spirit of God to be able to correctly minister to the questioning Jew. But there's a but. <laughs> but there is a but. There is a hinge to this psalm, and it's found here in verse 12. 
My days are a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like grass. Verse 11, but verse 12. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever. And the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. That's speaking of, of course, Israel, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, and Jerusalem in particular. It says here, you will have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her, yet the set time, the set time has come, for your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. Would you just pause with me for a moment? Your servants take pleasure in her stones. What stones? The, the stones, the cobblestones of the streets, of the stones of the dwellings, the houses. Oh no, it's more than that. Remember how the disciples in the 24th chapter of Matthew sat back on the Mount of Olives with Jesus and said, isn't it wonderful? And they looked at the thriving crowds going up the parapets and around on the causeway and up the stairs singing and praising and praying into the beautiful temple on Mount Moriah. And Jesus said to his disciples, having already groaned in his spirit and wept because of what he knew would come to pass. He said, you see those stones? You see those stones? There will not be one stone upon another. What? He was talking about the tremendous battle that would take place in AD 70 and the raising of the temple and its destruction and the scattering of the stones. And here prior to that prophecy, the psalmist is saying, your servants take pleasure in her stones. And even though they were scattered to a hundred or more nations of the world, at places and times of greeting and festivals, at the time of Passover, at the time of the festivals of Pentecost, when they gathered in their homes, be it Europe or even Asia or parts of Africa, or in the Americas, or even Australia, they would, as they farewelled their friends, or came to the end of their celebration, they would say, next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem. They took pleasure in her stones. And he says, and they show favor to her dust. And then it goes on to say, and this is amazing, so the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion and he shall appear in his glory. I think that's staggering. That got me <laughs> When I was about 16, in the early part of 1966, I thought, oh, I see it. I see it. 
that when the Lord rebuilds Zion, earthly Zion, restores Israel, when the modern state of Israel is declared and becomes a reality, that is the overture, that is the drum roll, that is the certainty of the Lord's return. He says here, For the Lord shall build up Zion and appear in his glory. And that dear rabbi crying on the way to the crematorium and the gas chamber, beaten, weakened, tormented, hated and scorned and condemned to die, God has regarded the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you cast me aside? You picked me up as a nation and proclaimed that I am the delight of your heart and cast me to the ground. You see, that's the spirit. That's what is felt. That is the philosophy of a broken heart and a dismembered hope. And then the Bible says, and this is the key, verse 18, Psalm 102, this will be written for the generation to come. You see, it wasn't the immediate. It wasn't the foreseeable. It was of a time way ahead that even the psalmist didn't know. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Now, they are not quite, as a nation, they're not quite there yet. But we do know that there is a day coming when every eye will see him. Every tongue will confess Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those appointed to death to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. It's unmistakable, isn't it? It's unmistakable. The return of Israel back into the land, the progressive working of the Spirit in cleansing, preparing, and then revealing their redemption in Messiah, in Yeshua. Oh, hallelujah. It's so wonderful here. The children of your servants, we close with this, the children of your servants, verse 28, will continue. Their descendants will be established before you. What Hitler decreed, what Nazism desired, worked towards deliberately, defiantly, with all the hatred that Satan could bring about in their hearts and minds, darkened as they were. And though six million innocent folk went to their deaths needlessly, criminally, sadistically, Israel will continue. Your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. What do you think about that? I'd like to send a, a greeting to Michael down in Melbourne, who was formerly a member of our church family. And of course, he is a man uh, renewed 
by the Spirit of God and lived for many years in Israel. And uh, of course, Peter, whose father, Peter's father, a dear, dear man, lay unconscious on the floor of Malthausen as the Americans came in their jeeps through the gates. And little Ava, Ava, who later on married a British Jew who came and uh, she got to know him and uh, she was born at the time of the arrival of the Americans. We remember those that are no longer with us, those that died, those that perished, those that survived but have died of old years and, and laden with burdens. We think of elves and we think of others as well. And we just say, Lord, we don't understand everything. We're not glib and foolish and able to just uh, have glib answers. But one thing we know, you have everything in the hollow of your hand and in the fullness of your heart. Do be with us next uh, Sunday when we live stream from the church. Uh, it's Mother's Day. And we will have a different kind of message. I feel it's uh, quite remarkable, might even shock you, shock you, about the two women that God mightily used, one becoming a mother in Israel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, thank you for your mercy without which we could not even survive, let alone live and thrive and bear fruit. Bless each and every one. Bless Michael in Melbourne, Peter on Bribey Island, Andrew here in Townsville, all of those who have come to know you as Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, their Saviour, Redeemer and Lord. And we are those of the nations who marvel and say, indeed this is your doing, marvellous in our eyes. Amen. God bless you. See you again next time.